Good morning, Liberty. Let's all stand and praise the Lord this morning. He's worthy of our praise. If you're glad to be in God's house, say amen. He's coming on the cloud. today. You are the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God. There is power in your name. God, we're so honored and grateful to be able to stand here today and worship you in the beauty of holiness. God, we love you. We cherish your presence and we ask you to meet with us today. We'll give you all the praise. 
honor and glory in your holy name we pray and all God's people said amen. amen it's a great day to be in the house of God look at your neighbor tell him I'm glad to be in God's house today amen members it's good to see you visitors we are exceptionally glad that you have chosen to worship with us members make all of our visitors feel welcome this morning we are honored that you've chosen to worship with us if you are here for the first time and you didn't receive on the way in a visitor card one of these fine gentlemen at the back of the auditorium dressed all sharp they have one just for you we just ask that you uh, fill out a little bit of information so we have record of your visit we are glad that you're here. It's going to be a great day in God's house. I want you to make your way around this auditorium. Tell someone you're glad to see them in the house of God today. make our way back to our seats to continue in worship. Let's sing a song about one of my favorite subjects, heaven. Amen. Here we sing. This world is not what it was meant to be. All this pain this suffering there's a better place waiting for me in heaven let's go every tear will be wiped away thank you Lord every sorrow and sin
looking around at you guys singing that song, I can tell that this place is full of a bunch of people who are ready to go home. Amen? Where the streets are golden, every chain is broken. Man, I want to go home. I am ready to be there with Jesus face to face. Amen? What a great day. Hey, uh, I was thinking about something earlier. If I were to say to you, Michael Jordan, Jerry West, Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain, you'd probably think of great basketball. If I were to say to you, Roger Staubach, Walter Payton, Emmett Smith, as much as I hate to say it, Aaron Rodgers, you'd probably think great football. If I were to say Mickey Mantle, Jackie Robinson, Babe Ruth, Derek Jeter, you'd probably think great baseball. And I could go on and on for hours and hours. We've exalted these men because they're great at what they've done. They're great. They are really good. They deserve recognition. But those guys that I just spoke of, they don't hold a candle to this. The Bible says, Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took on himself the form of a servant, and I love this, and was obedient to the death of the cross. The Bible says, wherefore, or because of that, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. We put so many people and so many things up on a pedestal, but the one who deserves to be higher than any of them is Jesus Christ, the one who died for you, the one who died for me. Amen. Let's praise and exalt him today.
Jesus is your Savior, if you've never accepted the gift of salvation, you know exactly who you are right now. You know that if you died right now, you would be lost without Jesus. But the gift of eternal life, the gift of salvation, it's a free gift, and it's the most simple gift you could ever receive. All you have to do is confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe you shall be saved. Jesus loves you. If you haven't heard that, I want you to hear it now. Jesus loves you. He always has. He always will. And the song says he's looking at you with love in his eyes. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, friend, don't wait. He's calling for you. He's calling today. you were on his mind. Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross. We are forever indebted to you for what you've done for us. God, we confess that no greater love has ever been displayed than the love that you displayed on the cross for us. The fact that you knew who we were and what we would do and you still came and loved us anyway enough to shed your blood and die on a cross rejected by the Father for us. Oh, what love. God, if anyone in this room has not accepted your love, may today be the day of salvation. I can promise them from experience they'll never be the same. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for moving in our presence today. Thank you for meeting with us. God, we feel you here today. Lord, I pray that you would remain with us as we hear from your word. And Father, we dig deep. And we let you move and work in our lives. We want to be changed. We want to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen.
Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Sammy. Take your Bibles this morning. Turn in the New Testament to Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Good to see you today in God's house. Thank you so much for being here. Visitors, thank you so much for joining us this morning uh, here in uh, the congregation. Or if you're listening to us this morning on Facebook Live or on the website, thank you also for joining us. It's good to be in God's house today. Amen. Recently watched a movie entitled The Dead Poet Society. Maybe some of you have seen that, Robin Williams. Uh, and uh, it was about a college, or rather a group of high school students that formed this society called The Dead Poet Society, and they'd read poetry and all these things. And I've always liked poetry. I've got some of my favorite authors that I've read after all my life. Uh, some uh, Christian uh, poets, some not. Uh, Robert Frost, one of my favorites. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow one of my also all-time favorites. He wrote a, a poem entitled, The Psalm of Life. The Psalm of Life, and here's how it reads. Lives of great men all remind us that we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. You know what that speaks of? That poem speaks of legacy. It speaks of testimony. It speaks of what you and I are doing as we live our lives every single day. We are putting in the footprints of the sands of time our indelible mark, our legacy, our testimony. Now, I don't know about you. I, I appreciate uh, the rundown of all the heroes. I don't have any NFL heroes right now. I've got to tell you that. Just a few maybe. But I'm very disappointed in some of the things that have been going on recently with them. I'm this close this close to burning some NFL jerseys. <laughs> Me and my boys have been talking about it all week. I hope they get past that, and it appears that they're going to. But there are some great legends of the game that Brother Hill mentioned this morning, and many of them were uh, some of my favorites. And the truth of the matter is, each of us live our lives, and we do different things in our careers, some in sports, and we've had some pretty good athletes come through here over, the, over time. Some scholars come through here over time that have gone on to college and now are uh, doctors and things like that. The truth of the matter is, though, that none of us know what will be considered great in the culture in the future. I don't know if any of you or, or even myself will ever be considered to be great among men and among women. But this one thing I know, you and I are leaving behind footprints on the sands of time. Every one of us. We all leave an impression. We all make an impression with the people we meet. And we all leave an indelible mark on what type of person we were, what we believed, what we lived for. And that makes an impact in the lives of those that are in our home, in our neighborhoods, in our churches, and ultimately in our sphere of influence as we go through our lives. This week, uh, you'll remember at the close of last Sunday morning, I shared with you the news of my dear friend, Pastor Jerry Reed, and uh, his health issues that have caused him to have to resign his ministry and move to New York. And I spent a lot of time this week thinking about that and Deeply grieved, I guess, for what he's going through and helpless to help. But as I begin to think about him and what he means to me and his life and his legacy, I went back and I remembered that first impression that he made on my family. The first Sunday in June 1978 that my family visited Liberty Baptist Church, my mom accepted Christ as Savior. It would not be long after that that other family members of mine and even grandparents would come and make professions of faith. And my heart grieves because he's having to leave the ministry now because of those impressions that he made. But even more than that, the great impact that he made on my life and my ministry over the years. I thought about even my upbringing. There was a big change that took place when we started attending Liberty, when we joined Liberty. My entire upbringing changed as my mom and dad began to follow the Lord Jesus under my pastor's leadership. 
I think of my salvation, I would ultimately, while making a couple of professions of faith, I would come to faith in Christ in July 26, 1992. And that day my life forever changed. And it was under Pastor Reed's ministry. I think of my calling, of how me and, and my father joined me by my side at the old platform, which was, didn't go out that far, somewhere about right here. And I knelt with tears, and my dad knelt with tears, and I gave my, my, my life for full-time service. I think of my marriage. We were talking to somebody this week about my wife and I being raised in church, and uh, I'm six years older than my wife, and so when I was in high school, she was in grade school, and that's kind of sick, right? That's kind of weird. But it, I was 27, she was 21 when we met and fell in love. I swept her off her feet. You know how it is, you know. I was such a hunk back then. Now I'm more like a chunk, but... Uh, <laughs> But we would end up getting married and somewhere about right here on the old platform in front of my pastor. I said my vows to my wife and we've been married for 25 years this December. Amen. I think about my children. Uh, Colin was born while we were here in Liberty. Kristen was born as we were in ministry elsewhere. But I think about that and I think about the mark that has been made on their lives because I've raised them the way that I was raised. I've taught them what I was taught. They believe what I believe because I've taught them the Word of God. I've, I've passed on to them the faith that was given to me and passed on to me. And now my ministry here today, this December, 15 years as the pastor at Liberty, 15 years that I've been here, and all of those things, as I look over my life, it all goes back and there's, a, there's a, a, an, again, a, a, an indelible mark on all of those things because of the life and the legacy of, of my pastor, as well as my father and my mother. My parents were awesome parents and still to this day, my mom's in heaven, but my dad's an awesome father. I love him and I'm so thankful that I get the privilege to be his pastor and I get to tell him what to do. I'm so thankful of the impression and the impact that godly people that surrounded me down through the years they've made on my life. Amen? Amen? And their legacy lives on because I live on right now. One of these days I'll pass my legacy on to my sons. And Lord willing, if the Lord Jesus tarries and God grants me life longer uh, than uh, 50, 60, 70 years, I don't know, my grandkids maybe even great-grandkids. Our legacy lives on, folks. So here's the question I asked you at the outset of the message this morning. What kind of an impression are you making on those around you? What kind of an impact are you making on your community? What is it that's being accomplished by your life? And here's the real question. Are you the real deal? Are you the real deal? Henry Ward Belcher said this, even the humblest of individuals exerts influence either for good or evil upon those around them. You see, the impact we make affects those around us. It affects our, our spouse, it affects our children, our grandchildren, it affects those uh, in our church those in our neighborhood, those at our jobs, what we are doing has an impact for good or for bad. Amen. I asked myself this question this week. What kind of an impact are you making, Rick? No doubt I'm not perfect. No doubt as a human being I make a lot of mistakes. That's why I told you for these 15 years, you don't put your eyes on me, you keep your eyes on the Lord hey. Jesus. But the question is, am I lifting people up or am I bringing people down? What would my wife honestly say about me? She's working with children this morning. By the way, those little kids, man, they can sing so beautiful. 
I was listening to Zoe, and man, she was, she was tearing it up this morning, singing, and got such a beautiful voice. You can hear Jenna over there. And some of them are just making a joyful noise like their parents do, but that's okay. <laughs> what would my wife say? What would my sons say about me, honestly, if they, were, if they knew I would never hear it in a private capacity? What would they say about me? My closest friends, what do they honestly think about me? Amen, brother, I love you too. The man we find in our text this morning is a man that I, that I love so very much. His influence is so great and so powerful, and the impact and legacy he left is one that we all ought to desire for our lives. It's one I desire for my life, but the Scripture is very limited on what it tells us about this man. His, his testimony is so simple, and yet it's so impactful. With that in mind, I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 11, and let's read one verse, in verse number 5. I hope you brought your Bibles with you this morning. If you didn't, it's on the screen for you. Here's what it says. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. Now this is some X-Files stuff right here, folks. This is some, this is some sci-fi stuff right here. He was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He pleased God. What is a Christian? You don't have to be a Bible scholar to, to really know what a Christian is, but I think we would all agree in the world in which we live today, there's a distorted view of what it means to be a Christian. Uh, what does it really mean to be a Christian? Well, we look at this word Christian and simply what it means is a Christ follower. But what does that mean? Does it mean like the way we follow sports heroes or does it mean the way that we, uh, we follow somebody on Twitter or on Facebook? I mean, I'm sure that's the definition that some in the world would maybe come up with, but what we see in the Scripture and what we see in the lives of those early saints was something very different than that. It wasn't just, are you my friend on Facebook? They were Christ followers. They were following Christ, and the disciples followed Christ to the death. And really, that's what Jesus said. If any man's going to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What he's literally saying there is leave everything else behind and you follow me. You be with me. You love me. You serve me and serve with me. Acts chapter 11 and verse 21 says this. As we think about Christians, listen to this. It says, And the hand of the Lord was with them. Talking, of, This is the history of that early church. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Amen. So thankful for the five we baptized a couple weeks ago. And it says, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Cleave unto the Lord. And he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. Now here it is. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. At this time in, in the church's history, Christians were being severely persecuted. We had a deacon and staff dinner last night and I was telling them we're talking about this burning of flags and, and all this stuff that's going on in our country today, which makes my blood boil, by the way. I said, 
Don't worry, guys, it won't be long and they'll be burning Christians again. It's going to happen. It happened in the early church and it will happen in the latter day church. But in that early church, they were called Christians first at Antioch. And here's the thing, they were called Christians first because they were Christians. Why did they get called Christians by... And listen, it wasn't a term of endearment. It was a term to identify those to be persecuted. Those people are following Jesus Christ. They are Christians. Do you see why I I said earlier that our world, our culture has a distorted view of what it means to be a Christian? I mean, we live in a world today where anybody's idea of a Christian is okay with whoever. And yet it's very different. I mean, it's kind of cool to be a Christian today. I mean, there's Christians or people that say they're Christian doing Christian music out there, smoking cigarettes and doing drugs and God only knows what. All under the name of being a Christ follower. I think we'd all agree that to follow Christ means to love Christ. Amen? Amen. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do the book. Amen. So how could we possibly live our lives different than the book tells us to live the Bible and still consider ourselves Christians? I told you before and I'll tell you again, we've got this hybrid version of Christianity. It's a, it's a mixture of the American dream with some Bible things. And I'm, I'm, I think I could say this and be right when I say I think it's more the American dream than it is the Bible stuff oftentimes. Listen to this survey with some statistics about people that say they're Christians. 60% of people surveyed say that they are religious. 67% say they're born again. (laughs) Now think about what that means to be born again. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. And yet, why is it that people that are supposedly born again, 67%, if all things become new, why are they still doing all the same old things? Going the same old places, hanging around with the same old people. 70% say that they're church members. We got members the FBI couldn't find. 41%, now think about this, 41% claim to be committed Christians, 44 moderately committed Christians, and 27 claim to have Christ constantly on their mind. You know what I think? I think some people need to get real. There are very few people out there that really know what it means to be a Christian. Last year, think about this, over $2 billion was spent on Christian books and Christian music. $2 billion. And yet, I look at the world around me and we do not live in a Christian culture. We live in a postmodern culture that is 100% about self. Number one. It's all about me. It's all about number one. Think about Facebook. What does that mean? My Facebook page. My face. You know, and really what it is, it's a venue. By the way, I've been off of Facebook for years now. My wife finally got off it. She said it was like a, a burden. It was like being set free. Other people got off of it recently, and they've said the same thing. It's like, whoo. Now, like anything, it can be used for good, and I'm not saying it can't be. And we use it for our church, and there's people watching today on Facebook. And I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about that, but let's be honest. It's where people can get on there and make their lives known to other people, and it's not a real life. It's a, it's a false life that they've created, a perception, an image that they want people to think about them. Right? Reality is we all know them. We know they're full of baloney but it's acceptable on Facebook. We 
We think about Christianity. We think about life. We think about legacy. And here's the question again. Are we the real deal? It says in verse 5 that Enoch had a testimony before God translated him that he pleased God. To me, that's a portrait of a real Christian, a real Christ follower. And with that in mind, I I want you to look with me at a couple of things this morning. And as we answer that question, if you're in the habit of marking in your Bibles or maybe taking notes on the bulletin, just write that down. Am I the real deal? And maybe here's the better question. Does God agree with your answer? Amen? Because some of us have trouble owning the reality of what we are and who we are. The biggest obstacle to to people coming to, to faith in Christ and being saved is owning the fact that they are a sinner born on default on a road to hell. The minute they own that, they have no problem in repentance coming to Christ. The problem is they think they're a good person. They think they're sincere. They think that, you know, all, all roads lead somewhere that's good. If all I got to do is just do my best and I'll be okay. Well, we know the Bible says something different than that. I want us to think about Enoch, who I believe was the real deal this morning. And as we get in the message, I want you to notice, first of all, how Enoch's legacy is described. Go again back to verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. In that verse, we find what I believe is the meaning of life. A couple of weeks ago in talking about the cross, we talked about the one thing, the most important thing. Talking with Brother Reed uh, this last week, he said, uh, I was telling him about, uh, he always asked about how things are going. I said, we had five baptized yesterday. And he said, you know what that tells me? That you've kept the main thing, the main thing. And we do a lot of things differently perhaps than we did back in 1978 when, when my family came. But you know, one thing that has not changed is we preach the Bible. We preach the Word of God. And we, don't, we haven't changed it. We haven't watered it down. You can, we're going to preach it when you like it and we're going to preach it when you lump it. Amen. We'll preach it when you shout, and we'll preach it when you pout. <laughs> so we see the meaning of Enoch's life here in verse 5. It says, by faith, Enoch. So here's the thing. In the Bible, names have a meaning. And in Enoch's name, there is a vast amount of meaning. It means this, dedication, commitment. So when you think about Enoch's name, just to mention his name says something about him. It gives us a legacy. He was a man of dedication, a man of commitment. Now again, in in Bible times, these names had a a meaning. And and here's what we find as we uh, read about the life of Enoch and the passages that cover his life. He was all in on God's plan. He followed God. He walked with God. He was all in about God's purpose for his life. And what was that? To please God. That's what God asked us to do. Please me. Have you figured out yet that you're not going to be able to please everybody in the world? I'll tell you right now, I figured that out. It don't matter what you do. If you do something, you can't please them. If you don't do something, you can't please them. So here's the way I look at it. If I'm pleasing God and I'm pleasing my wife about half of the time, then I'm doing pretty good. Amen? So we see in his name the meaning of his life. Phillips Brooks once said this, it doesn't take great men to do great things for God. It only takes committed men. But you realize that is a vanishing quality in our culture today? Loyalty is already gone. Commitment is soon to follow. Enoch was a committed man. That was the meaning of his life. Notice, secondly, the ministry of his life. You'll remember before Cain slew Abel, uh, or when Cain slew Abel, that the godly line had been destroyed and so a God would resurrect that godly line and destroy that or, or reset up that in the name of the one named Seth, the brother of Cain and Abel. And through that line of Seth is where Enoch came from. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 5, it says this in verse 21, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah, whose name means when uh, he shall die it shall be sent, speaking of the flood, Now it says in verse 22, And Enoch 
walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. At the age of 65 years old, Enoch met God. And again, like I said last week, while we would look backward to the cross, Enoch looked forward to the cross. And like Abraham of old, his belief, his righteousness, or his belief was counted as righteousness. He was saved by the same grace and the same blood that we're saved by. Only he looked forward to it, we look backward to it. Amen? But at 65 years old, Enoch accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. That tells me that it's ne you're never too old to accept Christ. You're never too old to, for God to do a work in your life. Amen? Amen? I think of Brother Hopkins over here. Brother Hopkins, how old were you when you got saved a few years back? In, in your 60s, right? Yeah, in his 60s. One of my dear friends, I love it, gives me a hug every single Sunday. And I, I look forward to that. My wife looks forward to that. And one of the things that it reminds me of, every single time he walks by, we shake hands and embrace as brothers in Christ and as friends. It reminds me that you're never too old for God to do a work in your life. And Enoch, at 65 years old, gave his life to Christ. And then for 300 years, the ministry of his life was that he walked with God. You think about the ministry of Enoch. He was faithful. He was committed. He was consumed with living a life. Listen, in order to please God, you've got to live a life that's consumed with God. Amen? Would you agree with that? In order to please God, you must live a life consumed with God. Now, I'm not saying that you don't work normal jobs. I'm not saying that you don't have family. I'm not saying that you don't have leisure time or hobbies and other things. I'm not talking about those things in a negative way or, or disregarding those things. But even in all of those things, your life can still be consumed with God. And be passionate for God because in all of those things, you can still find a way to bring glory to God through those things. Amen. Can you bring glory to God in football? I say absolutely. Can you bring glory to God in auto racing? Absolutely. We've seen people do it. Can you bring glory to God in just being a good stay-at-home mom? Absolutely. Can you bring glory to God in being a woman in the workplace that stands against the grain of, of the, the, the feministic movement? Yes, you can. Can you be a man of God that pleases God in the, at the job that you work? My friend, you don't have to listen to the dirty jokes. You don't have to go out after you leave, leave the job and go carousing around and, and throwing down some beers before you go home. You don't have to go do that. You can please God. You can be that light in that dark place. Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. God loved Enoch as much as Enoch loved God and much more, in fact, and so much so that he said, you know what? They were walking one day, and many have characterized this in different ways, but they're walking one day, and God said, you know what? I'm heading to the house. Why don't you just come with me? And he went. Notice, secondly, not only Enoch's legacy is described, but how Enoch's legacy is distinguished. The reason his legacy is distinguished is because it's uncommon. Amen? Me and uh, Cullen were talking the other day. Y'all pray for him. He's on a flight here in just a few minutes, heading to a conference in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, pray for him as he travels there. Uh, it's a financial planning conference, and one of his first ones uh, with his degree and all that stuff. It's, so, uh, you know, mom and dad are a little nervous and everything. So I, I had prayer with him and his uh, friend Brock as they headed out yesterday, and I'm excited for him. But nervous as a parent, you know. But he's in God's hands. He follows the Lord Jesus. He loves God. And so I believe God's going to bless him. He did fly an economy airline, so I don't know if the plane's going to make it or not. But if not, he'll be translated onto heaven, and I'll see him there, right? But uh, you think about Enoch's legacy. It was distinguished. It was different. That's what it means, different. You think of the, the world that we live in today and you think of the job that you're at or the PTA that you're in or the booster club you have a part in or even your own family. And there's you and there's everybody else. 
Are you distinguished? I'm not talking about proper wearing a certain dress attire, cutting your hair a certain way, or wearing a certain uh, hat or something like that. I'm talking about as a person. Are you different? I want you to listen to what Jude in verse 14 and through 16 says. Because here we, exa- we can examine the account of Enoch's life and we find that he possessed something that was very uncommon in his day. It says this, and Enoch also, by the way, the children's bulletin today covers this really well. If you want to go home and do that with your children. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Amen and amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers and complainers walking after their own lust and their mouth speaks great swelling words having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. In these verses right here, we see that Enoch lived in an ungodly day. Does that not sound familiar? An ungodly day. And I think it's significant in the Bible when you see a word repeated four times. And in those verses, the word ungodly is repeated four times. And so what do we deduct from that is the day in which Enoch lived was a very ungodly day day. You're going to remember that these are the days that preceded the flood. You remember that? You remember he begat Methuselah and Methuselah, the story was when Methuselah died, it shall happen. In other words, the day Methuselah died, it started raining. Okay? You can go back and study that out on your own. It's an interesting study, by the way. Because literally, God gave the exact day of when his judgment would fall. The Bible says, as in the days of Noah were, so it shall be when the coming of the Son of Man. Enoch lived in those days that preceded the flood, and there was evil in the land. Evil. He lived for God when no one else would. Are you willing to do that? I mean, it's kind of popular to be a Christian, but folks, that's changing. Are you going to live for God when no one else around you will? He labored for God when no one else would. Now, that's, that's, that's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? Because, I mean, we want help as we labor. But it might very well be that you labor alone. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to continue on, though no one goes with me? Still, I'll follow Jesus Christ. He loved God when no one else loved God. You see, what Enoch did is something we ought to be doing, amen? Amen. Like Enoch of old, we too ought to be living our lives in an uncommon way, in an ungodly world. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. Come out from among who? Come out from among the world. And listen, we don't hate them. But we better not be a part of them. In fact, we ought to love them the way Jesus loves them, but we don't go do what they do and to try to lead them to Christ. We don't go become them to try to lead them to Christ. Listen, and here's the thing, teenagers. You, I've, I've heard teenagers down through the years tell me this. You know what? Uh, I, just, I hang around them because I want to bring them to Christ. It don't work that way. You're not going to bring them up. They're going to bring you down more than likely. And so here's what you've got to do. Yes, you're going to love on them. You're going to pray for them. You're going to share your faith with them. But the thing that's going to bring them to faith in Christ is that you are, are different than them. And here's another thing, that they see in you a life that, that they desire. They see what it is to follow Christ. And they see that when you follow Christ, you know what? While things might be bad, while the bottom might have fallen out of your life, while you might have health problems and financial problems and family problems like everybody does, you can have a smile on your face and joy in your heart because you know somehow, some way, God's going to make all this work out for our good and His glory. And when the world sees that, you know the greatest hindrance to people coming to Christ are Christians. 
so-called. I mean, some people that are Christians, they're so negative and down and, you know. As Pastor Reed used to say, they could suck golf balls out of a drain pipe their lip is dragging the ground so far. You know? And you know what I'm talking about. And maybe you're one of those people, but folks, are anybody saved here this morning? If you're saved, you've been rescued, you've been redeemed from that life. And while, listen, I'm not talking about being fake. There's a time to smile and and be honest. There's a time when you frown because you hurt. I'm one of those people that was wired naturally with a face that I just, I don't have, my wife, you know, she's got a billboard flashing, come, come talk to me, come see me. My face says, get away from me, I'm going to hit you, you know. I don't naturally have that smile, and some people have it and some people don't. But regardless of of my look there, I need to put forth the, the effort to let people know there's joy in my heart. And I might be in excruciating pain from the things that I'm dealing with with my health, my own health issues. I might be struggling with things that are are financial that are not fun for anybody to go through. I might have some family things that I'm uh, curious about or wondering about or maybe have some difficulties. But in and above all that, I'm a born-again child of God. And in and above all of that, I can still have joy. You know why most people struggle with joy? is because they 100% all they think about is themselves. They're selfish, self-absorbed, self-centered people. But here's what happens. You've heard that that little acrostic for joy, J is for Jesus, O is for others, and Y is for you, 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 you. You put it in that order and joy will come into your life. Jesus, number one. Others, number two. You invest in other people's lives. You go after uh, 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 the opportunities to help other people and all of a sudden, I'll tell you, friend, I'll tell you, there is, there is a joy that comes from that. All of a sudden, you get to invest in other people's lives. You realize, you know what, I got it pretty good. Yeah. You know what I thought was so bad? Is it not that bad? Yeah. Yes, I hurt. Yes, I have difficulties. Yes, everything in my life's not perfect. But guess what? I've got joy. Hey. And folks, that's the testimony that we are leaving. Is it one of joy or is it one of Man, I don't want, whatever they have, Christian or not, I don't want any of that. Enoch, he did what we ought to be doing, living his life in an uncommon way in an ungodly world. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That speaks of what I just said. Let your light shine for men, before men. Let, let your testimony permeate the darkness around you like a light. Let people see. It's a good deal to serve Jesus. Amen? The darker the night, the brighter the light. Amen? Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. That's what we see in Enoch's life. He lived a godly life in an ungodly day. The difference, our culture today, everybody says they're a Christian. Everybody's got a song out. Everybody's got a bracelet you can buy. Everybody's got a cross around your neck. I was watching a YouTube video, a Harley Davidson uh, YouTube thing, and uh, one of these actor uh, guys who's been in prison in and out a couple of times, I mean, every time you see the guy, he's got a big old cross around his neck as he blurts out expletives and got a bottle of liquor in his hand. Could we honestly do that in light of what we learned about the cross the last two weeks? The cross on which the Prince of Glory died for my sins? How dare we live a life vile and wicked and self-indulgent with the cross hanging around our neck? 2 Timothy 3.5 says, These people have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And here's what he says. From such, turn away. Turn away. Verse 7 says, they're ever learning, but they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You ever wonder why? Some people in this world just don't get it. It doesn't matter what you do, what you say. It's like we think this way and they are in... It's hard to even explain where they are. Because their thinking is so different 
than my thinking. You know, the Bible said there would, would come a time when they would call good evil and evil good. Are we not there? And that speaks of that thinking. And it goes back to what I was talking about, the truth about truth. Some months back or a month ago or so, when I was using Miss Jackie as the example of what tr- real truth is and what they say it is. And if it's different, it can't be the same. So it is with Christianity. Are you the real deal? Are you the real deal? See, his testimony was uncommon. It was unusual. Verse 5 says, for before his translation, he had this testimony. Here's the thing that we need to understand. We each have a testimony. Everyone does. Saved, unsaved, we all have a testimony. What that means is a testament of what our lives are about. For some of you, you have a testimony of gossip. Some of you have a testimony of being a grumbler. Some of you have a testimony of... They just don't show up. Some of you have a testimony of being a God robber. Unfortunately, there's a lot of really difficult things in Malachi 3 that you have to deal with if that describes you. But here's the point. We all have a testimony. Hopefully it's not any of those testimonies, but one of the trademarks of the believer is that we have not only a testimony, but like Enoch, we have This testimony. Do you see it right there? It's unusual. Not just a testimony, because we all have that, but we have this testimony. What is it? That we please God. That we please God. Do you have a testimony, or do you have this testimony? Are you the real deal? Notice lastly, Enoch's legacy is described, it's distinguished, but notice it defined here. Verse 5. Here's how we see... Enoch's legacy defined, first of all, by his witness for God. It said, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony, circle that word, this, that he pleased God. He pleased God. That word testimony means bearing witness or giving record to. What it means is this is proof. Proof in the pudding. Authentication. It's actually a judicial word that means to take the witness stand. And we've asked this question before. You've heard it down through the many years by many other preachers, greater preachers than I. If you were put on trial to determine whether or not you are a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's a legitimate question. Would you be convicted? What we find here in Enoch's picture of his life is his life told a story. Did you know that your life is telling a story? It's one of a story of faith or it's a story of fear. It's a story of faithfulness or failure. Am I I saying the truth here? It's a testimony of one that serves or one that sets. And I've said it so many times over these 15 years. We're not saved to sit, we're saved to to serve is it one of believing God or not believing God so let me ask you these questions do others know that you are what you say you are I've had people because I've, I talk to everybody in town that I come in contact with and at some point we're going to get around to Jesus and what happens in this small town is invariably names come up do you know so and so do you know that they go to your church uh, maybe. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about what you know about them, and maybe I'll admit that, you know. Would others around you say that you are what you say you are? Do others see your Christian walk, or is it just a bunch of Christian talk? Amen? Again, if you're on trial, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Are you the real deal? So we see Enoch's testimony defined by his witness for God and his walk with God. We see that, that he walked with God, he pleased God. And that word pleased literally means a walking with. It means to, he liked to hang out with Jesus, amen? It's like a parent who's satisfied with what their kids are doing. God was satisfied with Enoch's life. 
He was pleased. It says in Genesis 5.24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Wouldn't it be awesome to have that testimony? You know, Rick Ross walked with God. One of these days, if the Lord tarries, I'm going to lay in a box down here. I've already told my wife I want to do my own funeral from video screen, and I'm going to have the deacons rig it up so my hand can raise up, you know, from the castle. <laughs> Truth, truth of the matter is, the Bible says it's a point in a man wants to die and we'll, we'll all come to that place in time. Our lives are winding down. And our lives, they're going to mean something. They're going to stand for something, the impact. What's the testimony going to be? I told my family members, I said, listen, you numbskulls, I am not going to stand in a pulpit and preach your funeral and lie about how awesome you were. If you were a dummy, I'm going to tell them you were a dummy. I'm, you know, I'm teasing a little bit about that, but I'll tell you, I preached my grandfather's funeral here. And he was, he was saved early in life, but he didn't live for Christ. His own words, his own admission. He had a clear-cut salvation testimony, and man, I, I hammered him because I told him straight up, I'm not preaching your funeral if you're lost and on your way to hell, Grandpa. He said, I know the Lord Jesus as my Savior. And he went back to a time when he accepted him, when he was baptized as well. But he said, you know, I followed all kinds of things and I never really put a lot of effort into following Christ. Later in life, you know, he looked at life a lot differently. But he had got on that bandwagon that somehow, in some way, it's just too late to change. And I told the, I told the family, he was no super saint. But we're not a saint because we're awesome and amazing. We're a saint because God's awesome and amazing. And it's his saving grace, amen? Ain't it pleased God when he walked, because he walked with God? I know parents that try to please their kids. You know, and I, I like to do good things for my kids, but let's be honest. More, 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 more. I've got an iPhone 6, and they got 8 out already. I'm, my parents don't take good care of me. How about no cell phone? Amen. Brother Hill said when he got his first cell phone, it was like a brick, you know, one of those big old giant things. I said, well, at least you had a weapon you could use, you know. Some, some parents sit out, they, all they please their kids, please their kids. Some try to please their parents, and, you know, that's, that, that in and of itself is a difficult task. Some people try to please their pastor, and while I appreciate the effort, you know, I'm human. Some pastors try to please their people. I can tell you right now, as a pastor, you'll never do that. Because by the time you please this group, oh, the air conditioner feels awesome. This group over here is doing this, and this group right here is grabbing blankets. So what do we do? We please God. Amen? And the Bible tells us how to please God. It speaks of righteousness. Live your life for Christ according to his word. Flee youthful lust, Paul told Timothy. Live your life by the book. Jesus says, why do you say that you love me and don't do the things I say? It speaks of faithfulness. 99% of the Christian life is just showing up. Hey. Amen. It speaks of commitment. So many people join a church and they never at one time have an inkling that, you know what, it's incumbent upon me to get involved and be committed and do something. And they let everybody else do stuff. You know what, that grass don't just get mowed by itself. These rugs don't get vacuumed by themselves. These light bulbs don't get changed by themselves. We got people that faithfully do that stuff, not just ever so often, every week. It speaks of giving. Turning these lights on. Amen? You get a $2,000 electric bill in the month of July this year. 2000 bucks to turn on lights a couple of times a week. I, I told them, listen, we're, we're serving God, and, and uh, you know, don't you think you could kind of cut us a break? It's for God. I mean, why not some free electricity? <laughs> no. It speaks of loving. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, again, 
Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things I say? Romans 8, 8. So then they that are in the flesh, they cannot please God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, 2. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ that have received us, that you ought to walk and to please God. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. What does that speak of? Just doing the Bible. Folks, here's the deal. If you're not in the Bible, you're not going to be able to do the Bible. Amen? You've got to know the Word of God. Let me close with this. Scottish Reformation, there was a man by the name of George Wizard, and uh, he was a man that stood boldly in his day, which was an evil day, and it was a time of great persecution in the Re Reformation. He was ex ex executed for the truth that he stood for. And the way they executed him is they tied him to a post saturated the wood beneath him with an accelerant and they lit the flame and then they had put it onto the wood. It would eventually, rather quickly actually, consume his, started consuming the wood and it reached up to his clothes and then his body and it wasn't long and George Wizard fell to his knees in utter pain. And here's what he said. He said, Christian brothers and sisters... Be not offended at the word of God on account of what you see prepared for me. Love the word and suffer patiently for the gospel's sake. Should any of you be called upon to endure persecution such as I have today, fear not those that destroy your body, for they cannot touch your soul. I have served the Lord Jesus Christ with gladness and faithfulness and I would gladly do it all over again. Within minutes, George Wizard, the flames reached his body and consumed it and he was dead. But among those that day watching, lining the, the, the castle area there was his opponents and his supporters. Those that followed George Wizard as he followed Christ and those that opposed him as he followed Christ. But in the crowd that day was a young man by the name of John Knox. And John Knox stood there with his fist clenched and his eyes streaming tears. And as he gazed on his hero in the faith, giving his life for the Lord Jesus, he vowed that day that the cause for which his mentor had died would not be lost. And he asked God to help him to be that kind of a Christ follower. The kind that George Wizard had been. The kind that was willing to give it all to the very end for the Lord Jesus. I want you to understand something this morning. The Lord Jesus died for us and here's what he expects. He don't expect us to die for him, but he does expect us to live for him. And if called upon to die for him, he expects that as well. But we get off easy today. All we have to do is simply live. And that life is an abundant life that Jesus has brought us. And it's a joy. There's no threat to be burned at the stake. There's no threat to be burned in a garden party as a Christian. There's no threat to be slaughtered or even our finances taken away or our family martyred because of our faith. Not here. Not now. It's simply live for me. Be what you say you are. Be a Christian. Be a Christ follower. Be the real deal. Because when I come to the foot of a cross and I look up in the eyes of my Lord and Savior as He's bleeding and as He's dying and as Brother Hill led us to, to think about and to contemplate as He looks with, uh, at me eye to eye, I have to vow. As He dies for me, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to serve you. I want... Uh, you're dying for my apathy, my failure, my sinfulness, my anger, my hate. And the least I can do is live for you. Be the real deal. God would later use John Knox to shake an entire country, the country of Scotland, where the Ross family comes from. The entire country of Scotland would be shaken with the gospel of Christ. And those people would get to see what it looks like to be a real Christian. I'm not concerned this morning with what you say you are. I'm concerned this morning with whether or not you are what you say you are. 
or are you the real deal? Talk is cheap. You heard this before. Your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Your kids don't care what you say. They care about what you do. And in your home, in a pastor's home, I preach this on Sunday. I preach this on Wednesday night. I'll guarantee you this. I better go home and live it out in front of my boys Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday because I train my boys to call it out when I don't. My son the other day, Cullen, he, he came in. He had a real stressful week getting some stuff done where he could head out on this trip. And we are talking about this NFL deal during the national anthem. And uh, he's 21, getting ready to be 22. But you know what? I'm still teaching him. That's my duty as a father. Until I die, I'm still teaching him. He makes his own choices now. But I'm still teaching he said, Dad, I, I get it. I, I understand and I agree with you wholeheartedly, but why do you get so upset about it? I said, you want to know why? I said, because I had family members on both sides that fought in the Civil War, and so did you. I had a great-grandfather, which was your great-great-grandfather, that fought in World War I and was wounded and received a Purple Heart for that flag right there. My wife's grandfather, who is your great-grandfather, fought in World War II at Normandy, the Battle of the Bulge, 101st Airborne, and was wounded, received a Purple Heart, and bled, and almost died for that flag right there. And we've had others in our family that served. That flag means something to me. And I'll defend it. I don't have a lot to offer in a physical sense anymore. Old age and health and a little bit of overweight hinders me there. But you know what? I'll use my voice to stand up for that flag. But let's think something about something way more important. The cross. Five generations of my family have come through this church since the early, well, late 1970s, early 1980s. We've invested We've lived, we've given, we've served. And more than anything, the Lord Jesus Christ that built this church and who's still building this church, he gave the ultimate sacrifice for me. And all he asks is that I live for him. And so you know what? With the same veracity that I stand for that flag, I'll stand for that cross and for this church and for this book, the King James Bible, and for Christians that are the real deal. Enoch's testimony stands in the Word of God as an undying legacy. What about you? You have a legacy. It will be cemented in concrete for eternity when you die. What will it be? Enoch's life and legacy stands before us today. 365 years he lived. 300 of those years he lived for Christ. He walked with God and he pleased him. He was the real deal. Are you? Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, as we come before you today, we're grateful for the word that you've given us in the life of Enoch, the testimony of a great man of God, a man so great that he was one of only a couple that did not see death. What a powerful testimony. He loved you so much and walked with you so closely that you just took him. He was the real deal. 
Father, under the sound of my voice this morning are a great group of people that I believe are the real deal. And God in heaven, I thank you for them. I thank you for the work that they are doing here at Liberty alongside of my wife and I. And I thank you, Father, for their faithfulness, their commitment, and their undying love for you. God, if the Lord Jesus tarries his coming, I look forward to growing old with many of these dear folks, serving you together, passing over some of these duties to the younger generation that we've raised up that's coming behind us that have the same testimony. God, I'm thankful. But also under the sound of my voice, Lord, are no doubt some folks that have never given their life to Christ. They've never been to the foot of the cross and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Perhaps they've got religion and perhaps even today they call themselves Christians. And maybe they've turned over some new leaves. Maybe they've professed, like the statistics said, those to be born again, but nothing changed. And yet still my Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new instantaneously. It's not a process in time, Father. It's an instant in time when people are saved. And perhaps under the sound of my voice this morning, there's those that have never experienced that moment in time. Dear God, if you've spoken to their heart this morning, they could come forward and we would take them to a private prayer room and we can show them how that they can know Christ today. And like Enoch, they can please God as a child of God. And it can start today, right now. God, perhaps under the sound of my voice are again those that they're here, thank God. Thank you that they're here, that they've heard the word. But life tomorrow is going to look very different for them as they go to their jobs or go to their schools. Life on Tuesday is going to look very different than what they're living today. And so throughout their week, they'll live something different than what they said they were today. And God, only you know who they are. You know the heart. You look upon the heart because we can only look on the outward appearance. And we are easily fooled by appearance. But God, you know the hearts of men. You try the hearts of men and women. And maybe there's somebody that has given their life to Christ. They've accepted him as Lord and Savior. And they're under conviction this morning because they know some things need to change right now. They need to start being the real deal. They need to walk with you. They need to get in the Word, they need to get on their knees, and they need to get up, and they need to walk with you and walk for you. They need to be that light in this dark world. Genuine, authentic, real. You know the needs, Father. Have your will in your way. In Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, as Brother Hill sings.